it's Mother's Day, so I'm going to start off by sharing a little bit about my mom. And my mom, she is an inspiration to me. She grew up in a less than stellar home. She grew up in a lot of brokenness. And, you know, it left a lot of hurt. It left a lot of wounding. And it really left her with this perception of herself that was not how God saw her. It was deeply wounded. And yet, in her teen years, she was on a trajectory of total self-destruct. You know, it was not a good one. And yet along the way, people deposited and God deposited little moments where he showed himself to her. And he deposited truth and love and hope into her life. And then as a late teen, early, early 20s, she chose to follow God. And there was no looking back after that. There was no turning back. Does it mean that all that stuff fell away? No. There was still <laughs> brokenness to be dealt with and hurt to be dealt with. But she persevered through everything that she had to face. She chose Jesus every day, even though it was hard. She messed up, and she admitted it, and then she would choose Jesus again, you know, and she would point us to Jesus, you know, and in turn, I, I got to reap the benefit. You know, my brothers and I, we got to reap a mom who pointed us to God. We got to reap a mom who chose God over addiction. We got to live a life where addiction didn't rule our house, you know, where my mom was sober, where my mom was alive. And this is something that is a gift to me. And I realize it's a gift. And I realize that though she chose this before I was even alive, I got to reap the benefit. Her choice then, even though she didn't know I was going to be there, even though she didn't know my brothers would be there, or who she'd meet along the way, had implications that last into generations. And you know, I know that my life is forever changed because of the choices she made before Ave is even born. And so I want you to think about your life. Who in your life has been somebody that you admire, that you regard highly, or has talent, or has been influential for you? And I want you to think of the fact that probably this person doesn't see themselves as anything spectacular or great or influential or even out of the ordinary. And they may even see themselves as insecure, insignificant, unimportant. You know, my mom doesn't see herself as something important. And yet she chose to believe what God said anyways. We really must allow God to dictate our identity and our path, even if it seems foreign and against our nature. And as a matter of fact, it will probably actually kind of offend our nature. It will offend who we are because it doesn't line up with what we think and how we perceive. So before we get into things, let's pray for a minute. Father God, I thank you. I thank you that you are a God who sees the whole picture. You are a God who sees us so differently than we see ourselves. You are a God who created us and made us intentionally. None of us are an accident. None of us are forgotten. And God, you invested in us so much more than we know or understand. And so God, this morning I ask that you would show us, at least even just a little bit, how you see us. Show us where we're perceiving ourselves in a way that isn't like the way you see us. Holy Spirit, I ask that you would work this morning in us. And I thank you for all the people that you have set before us that have laid out a path that we get to follow behind, the ones who point to you, the ones who show us love. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, as I was thinking about it, you know, I was thinking about the idea of us kind of having this perception of ourselves and that God actually has such a different path for us than often we think. And, you know, there is a greater, there's something greater for you and I than just this safe or comfortable or known evaluation that we have of ourselves. We build these boxes around ourselves 
these walls, they're made out of, you know, our personal perceptions and evaluations, insecurities, hurts, all these things that we collect over our life. And as we grow closer to God, you know, he starts to whisper something different than these walls we've put up around ourselves. He starts to whisper vision for our lives and lead us beyond these walls. He starts to whisper about maybe time with him and what it could look like or something we could do for somebody, freedom that we could have, you know, ways we could help people. And these whispers, they kind of put these windows into these boxes that we've built that we can see out beyond. We can see the horizon. If you've ever been out on a hill, you can see way far away, and it kind of pulls at you. These whispers, this is what it does. As God whispers something different, something deep inside of you is drawn toward it, even if you're kind of like, oh, I don't even like that. I, I can't do that. I wouldn't do that. There's something inside of you that is drawn toward this. And, you know, we press our faces against this glass that God, this window that God has put in this box we've created around ourselves. We press our faces against it, and we see that, and we long for it. I don't know if any of you can, can register with that, but I need, even for my own life, even now, there are things I've boxed in that I know God talks about to me, something different. And my spirit actually longs for that, even though there's a part of me that's petrified of what he's talking about. Or part of me that doesn't even really like what he's talking about. My spirit longs for it. But so often, as God speaks of this freedom, as we look at the horizon and long for it, there's a part of us that discounts ourselves. We say, I can't. I can't. I couldn't possibly, I won't, because of da-da-da-da-da-da-da. This pain, this hurt, this failure, whatever it is, we discount ourselves. And it's not just us as women. I think everybody does this. And we sit curled up, confined in this little box. Yeah, all we need to do is stand. It's not something crazy. We just have to stand. And you know, how we stand is we stand in what God says. Just like Pastor Jeff last week, he said that God cannot sin against us. Therefore, we can fully trust him. We can fully trust what he says. What he says about you, what he's calling you to, it is 100% trustworthy. There is not a flaw in it. And he calls you to that, but so often we say, nope. This is actually where I belong. This is what I know. This is what I understand. And so this is where I'm going to stay. But if you will let him call you to stand in these things that he says, he will show you a different future. And he will lead you to a different future. And every single one of us actually has a deposit in us already there that affects not only you and your own future, but it affects the future of those around you. The people around you that you know are affected by whether or not we choose to stay in this box or we choose to follow God. And so there is a woman in the Bible that she understood this. Her name was Deborah. And I'm going to read you her story. It's going to be a bit long. I'm just going to read the full chapter. It's found in Judges 4. So listen to this. You can find it if you'd like. We're not going to put it on the screen because it's quite long. Judges 4. The Israelites again did what was evil in the sight of the Lord after Ehud had died. So the Lord sold them to King Jabin of Canaan, who reigned in Hazor. The commander of his army, Sisera, who lived in Herosheth of the nations. Then Israel cried out to the Lord because Jabin had 900 iron chariots, and he harshly oppressed them for 20 years. Deborah, a prophetess and the wife of Lipidoth, sorry, was judging Israel at the time. She would sit under the palm tree of Deborah between Ramah and Bethel in the hill country of Ephraim, and the Israelites went up to her to settle disputes. She summoned Barak, son of Abinoam, who from Kadesh, in Naphtali, and the troops of Mount Lubala. I am sorry, I'm having trouble, my mouth does not want to say these words, and said to him, hasn't the Lord, the God of Israel, commanded you, go deploy the troops 
on Mount Tabor and take with you 10,000 men from the Naphtalis and the Zebulonites. Then I will lure Sisera, commander of Jabin's army, his chariots and his infantry, and to fight against you, and I will hand him over to you. Barak said to her, if you will go with me, I will go. But if you do not go with me, I will not go. I will gladly go with you, she said, but you will not receive the honor. The honor will be given to a woman. So Deborah got up and went with Barak to Kadesh. Barak summoned Zebulun and Naphtali to Kadesh. 10,000 men followed him, and Deborah went with him. Now Heber, the Canaanite, had moved away from the Kenites, the son of Hoab, Moses' father-in-law, and pitched his tent beside the oak tree of Zananim, which was near Kadesh. It was reported to Sisera that Barak, son of Abinoam, had gone to Mount Tabor. Sisera summoned all his 900 iron chariots and all the troops who were with him. Then Deborah said to Barak, Go, this day the Lord has handed Sisera over to you. Hasn't the Lord God before you? So Barak came down from Mount Tabor with 10,000 men following him. And the Lord threw Sisera, all his charioteers, and all the army into a panic before Barak's assault. Sisera left his chariot and fled on foot. Barak pursued the chariots and the army as far as Harasheth of the nations. And the whole army of Sisera fell by the sword. Not a single man was left. Meanwhile, Sisera, this is the man who was oppressing them, had fled on foot to the tent of Jael. I'm sorry, it gets a little gory here. The wife of Hebner, the Kenite, because there was peace between Jabin of Hazor and the family of of Heber, the Kenite. Jael went on to greet Sisera and said to him, Come on in, my lord. Come with me. Don't be afraid. So he went with her, and she covered him with a blanket, and he said to her, Please give me a little water to drink, for I am thirsty. She opened a container of milk and gave him a drink and covered him again. Then he said to her, Stand in the entrance to the tent. If a man comes to ask you, Is there any man here? Say no. And while he was sleeping from exhaustion, Heber's wife, Jael, took a tent peg, grabbed a hammer, and silently went to Sisera. She hammered the tent peg into his temple and drove it into the ground, and he died. When Barak arrived in pursuit of Sisera, Jael went out to to greet him and said to him, Come, and I will show you the man you are looking for. So he went with her, and there Sisera lying dead with a tent peg through his temple. That day God subdued King Jabin of Canaan before the Israelites. The power of the Israelites continued to increase against King Jabin of Canaan until they destroyed him. So all that to say, Deborah, in that gory story, chose to follow God, even though she really embraced a position that she wouldn't normally have. She was a woman doing a job that normally went to men. She was the only female judge in the whole Bible. She was also a prophet. She was known as the mother of Israel, and she sat under these palms and would judge and help people sort out the disputes. And what God asked her to, to go and talk to uh, Barak, she said, okay. And she used her position to bring influence so that God could give the Israelites the peace and the freedom that they needed from a very oppressive nation. Not only that, she set up other people to succeed by her obedience her obedience didn't just like lead to something happening because she did it. No, her obedience led to Barak's obedience, led to the army's obedience, led to Jael being able to do what she needed to do to free Israel, which led to Israel's freedom. So not one of these people didn't affect the other. She did not shy away from being needed, but rather stepped into the battle for God's glory. And in that, she gave clarity and direction. She gave faith and hope. She set the stage for other people. And this is the same for you and I. Your obedience sets the stage for somebody else's obedience. It boosts somebody else's faith. It helps them see God differently. 
Maybe give some resources that they don't have so that they can accomplish what God's asking of them. This life is not a solo journey. It's not for us to live all on our own. We affect and need each other. You need my obedience, and I need yours. And the generations ahead need you, just like you need them. And the generations behind need you, just like you need them. Because Deborah trusted the Lord, Barak's hope was boosted. And as a prophet, she represented the word of God. So as she went into this battle, she wasn't necessarily, it doesn't say she wheeled a sword or anything. She was there, and she represented the word of God, and she brought hope to the army, and it reminded the army that God's got this. Judges 4.14 says this, Go, this day the Lord has handed Sisera over to you. Hasn't the Lord gone before you? So Barak came down from Mount Tabor with 10,000 men following him. Deborah only had to say, remind them, what has God said? Her faithful hope and obedience helped others live out God's purposes in their life. And your obedience does the same. Can you think of a time where somebody has obeyed God and it's affected you? Maybe it's been a prayer they've prayed. Maybe it's been just a word of encouragement or something they've given you. You know, it doesn't really need to be anything huge. It's often actually the smallest steps of obedience that affect us deeply. You know, Deborah went into battle encouraging them. Sometimes all we need to do is pray. Have you ever had those moments where somebody's name just would not leave your mind? Why? Why is that name persistently there? Maybe you need to pray for them. Maybe there is a little note of encouragement you need to drop off to them. Maybe there's a little gift you get to bring to them. There's probably a reason. Don't brush aside those little moments, those little nudges. Maybe it's something nobody will even know about, but it affects them, and they don't even know. Again, I want to come back to my mom. You know, she's a regular human being like you and I. She's had a hard life, like I said, and it's not just before she met God, even after meeting God. It's kind of been one hurdle after another. But in it all, she chooses to point me and my brothers and anybody else around her to Christ. She's not perfect, and she readily admits this. But I know for a fact that her prayers are what carried me through my teen years. Without those prayers, I don't know where I'd be today. I know for a fact that those prayers kept me so many times. You know, and she prays for people around the world. How much do her prayers leave an impact? She doesn't even know the legacy that she's leaving from the people she's prayed for or the people she's brought into her home and just cared about or the little words of encouragement she's spoken. You know, she doesn't feel like she's enough. She doesn't feel like what she's done really means much. But I know that it does. I know these things are important. So you see, the deposit in you, it matters. You have gifts and talents and knowledge and experiences that God wants you to place into his hands. He's asking you, will you let me use these? They could even be things that you don't like, experiences that leave you with pain. But if you'll put them in his hands, he will actually use them. He will actually use them. It's kind of like gems in the rough. Gems in the rough, if you look them up, but when they're first dug out, they they really don't look like what we see, these gleaming, beautiful, shiny, you know, diamonds or rubies. They just look like rocks. Sometimes they're kind of sparkly. But, you know, they could be easily uh, mistaken for something else, for being worthless. It can be hard to recognize and easy to discard them. They're often encased in a lot of rock. They're buried under dirt. And it takes this chipping away to actually find and discover and see the gems that we love to carry around, you know, on ourselves and think are so beautiful. And God, he is like this master at finding 
He knows exactly where to find the gems in you and how to find them. He knows exactly how to chip away the rock and cut them perfectly so that they catch the light just right to show who he is and show his character. And so you can trust him when he calls you, that you can follow him. You know that he knows that you've got the goods for what he's asking you to do. And that he will give you the Holy Spirit strength to do what he's asking you to do. And it says in Ephesians 2.10, it says this, For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. Like Deborah, if you trust him, he will prepare you and position you, just like that gem, so that the light, when it shines through it, it will uniquely, in a unique way, point to his character and who he is because he's shaped it and polished it so it catches the light just right. You have things in you that point to God's character when you let him have them in a unique and beautiful way. And so I encourage you, let him have them. You've got what you need for him to do what he wants to do. Deborah allowed God to position her uniquely. Women were not usually put in these places of authority at that time. And she used her unique skills and position to point to God and inspire others to trust him. She allowed God to place her outside of expectations and tradition and normal and walked in great faith. So much so that really today, we're still talking about her. We're still using her story to inspire others and to inspire ourselves to walk in faith. You do not know the steps of obedience, the skills, the experiences, the gifts that if you allow God to have them could inspire somebody else to take steps of faith and obedience. You are not insignificant. The enemy wants us to believe that we don't matter that what we do doesn't really matter. He wants us to believe that whether good or bad, whatever we do has little to no impact on the people around us. And it's a lie. The truth is, the devil, all he wants us to do is get lost in ourselves or in something other than God. And he is a total liar. He actually cannot tell the truth. It says in John eight forty four, it says this, he, who is Satan, is a murderer from the beginning It does not stand in the truth because there is no truth in him. When he tells a lie, he speaks from his own nature because he is a liar and the father of lies. The enemy wants us to believe that we're just ourselves and it doesn't matter what we do. What you do matters. And it matters not just maybe for the few little bits of people around you. There is a ripple effect to your life that you actually cannot see the end of, just like Deborah. I can guarantee you she wasn't thinking, in thousands of years from now, I'm going to be written in the most important book in the whole world, and people will be talking about me. What we do has a ripple effect that we can't really see beyond. And so I encourage you, don't take, not to be a big burden, but don't take your life too lightly. Don't make it a burden, but trust God. He wants this ripple effect to affect people in such a beautiful and incredible way. And he's given you what you need. The story of Deborah can feel larger than life. Battles and war and big outcomes. But the reality is each one of us has a role to play in God's story. An important role. Whether it's like Deborah being an unconventional, fearless voice, or J.L. who took down this oppressive leader, or one of the military people who wasn't even mentioned, who just did what they were supposed to do. Or whether it's somebody else that we don't see in the story, but that had a hand in this happening. All their roles mattered. Every single one of them was needed. So think of this. My mom was headed down a road of destruction, right? Suicide, drugs, total self-destruct, but God. Along the way, he positioned people. I don't know their names. I don't even know if my mom remembers all their names. 
to point her in his direction, to point to him. Had they not trusted him enough to live the life that he was asking them, I don't know if she would have found him. So then where would I be? So their choice, this nameless person somewhere in some city, affected my mom to choose to follow God, which affects me to choose to follow God, which then affects all of you and my children who then have a choice. Will they follow God? Who then have a choice? Who then have a choice? And it goes on and on, and it's so beautiful, isn't it? Isn't it incredible? That, and it's not a big thing. Those moments that my mom was pointed to Christ were little moments. They're things he, she might have mentioned in passing, and yet they greatly affect my life. Greatly affect my life. I don't even know if I would be alive had they not stepped in and pointed her to Christ. How incredible. And I think each one of us probably along the way, if we look back in our lives, have people that that's the reality for us too. Every person before us on this journey of faith has helped set set the stage for our journey. And ours does the same for others coming behind us. The same God who called Deborah to obedience is calling you. He's calling me. Hebrews 12.1 says this, Therefore we also, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which so easily ensnares us, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us. I am fully aware it is not easy. That what I'm talking about is not easy. Daily setting aside our lives for Christ. And yet, if you think about it, when we listen with our spirit, it calls us. It's actually what we long for. It does mean that things in us have to die for sure. But it's what we long for. It's what will satisfy us. It it is what will fulfill us. And it's what leads to life. All the little and big choices matter. When you read your Bible, it matters. When you worship, it matters. When you pray, when you forgive, when you choose healing, when you show up at church, when you serve the body, when you love your neighbor, when you use your spiritual gifts, when you take those bold steps of faith, These all matter. You matter, not only for your future, not only for the futures of the few around you, but for the future of the church. You matter. Your choices matter. So I have a few questions for you. Is there anything that you feel the Holy Spirit has been nudging you or speaking to you about that you have brushed aside, put off, or ignored? Maybe it's reading your Bible. It doesn't have to be some, like, big thing. Maybe it's choosing God. Maybe it's saying, okay, I want you to be Lord of my life. Maybe it's letting go of a pain or a bitterness. Maybe it's something you're stepping into, something of obedience. I encourage you, take the step, one step at a time. It's not a whole, take the whole thing. It's one step at a time. So today, will you choose to take that one step? Today, will you choose to be like, okay, I'm going to read my Bible. And then tomorrow, okay, I'm going to read my Bible. Second question. Where are you allowing your evaluations and perspectives of yourself and life to dictate how you live rather than allowing God to lead you? Remember that box I was talking about? Are there things you're allowing to box you in? Are there things that you've decided, this is how I am, this is who I am, this is what I'm slotted for, but God is kind of pushing up against? He's putting a window in it saying, there's more, but you're choosing to stay in that box. Will you stand up in who God is asking you to be? Third, what is one step you can make toward obedience? Just one step. 
This step could be anything. It could be read your Bible. It could be pray. It could be admit something to somebody. Just one step. Remember to get out of the box. It's just standing up. Question four. Is there someone you can share this with so you're not walking this out alone? Remember, we're journeying together. It's easier to journey together. And when you get weary, you have somebody who's kind of nudging you along. So I encourage you to take a moment and think of the people coming up behind you, the ones who are running ahead of you. Your decision to stand up and let God lead you makes a difference in all these people's lives. It could be people who aren't even alive yet. It could be your kids or your grandkids, cousins, nieces, nephews, friends, kids. So your decision today to make that choice will affect them. Let's pray. Father God, I thank you. I thank you that you, God, are a great God and that you lead us one step at a time outside of the boxes of our expectations, boxes of our, our perceptions and understandings of who we are into something so much more beautiful and profound and satisfying. So Lord, I pray for each person here. God, as they sit down and they kind of evaluate and they realize that our lives are so intertwined, God, that we will each choose to let you call us to something greater, something bigger, something bigger than ourselves. Lord, I thank you that you that you are so gracious and walk this out step by step. I pray that where there's healing needed or forgiveness, God, that you will show the steps to that. I thank you, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen.